All right, then I would like to welcome everybody to this webinar today, which is um, the fifth webinar in the Globe Drought uh, e-learning series and the second technical webinar. Um, the last one, as you might know, was about meteorological drought. And today we're moving on to the topic of hydrological drought. And uh, for this purpose, I would like to welcome Professor Petra Döll, um, who is Professor of Hydrology at the University in Frankfurt. And uh, her focus is to research hydrological modeling, um, including modeling the assessment of global change, like climate change and so on. So I would just like to give the word to um, Professor Petra Döll, please. Yes, hi. I'm glad to see 12 participants and I'm looking forward to this webinar because it's my first webinar ever, so I'm excited. And I also had a very good time preparing the webinar because it always helps in your own research if you try to explain something to people. So that's really also good for the research. And I hope that at least some of you had also the opportunity to look on the 15 minute video that uh, um, Yannick had prepared on hydrological drought that I gave to show you a little bit more how also our global water model, water gap is used to uh, calculate hydrological drought hazards. But you can also look at it later. So the title of my lecture is what is hydrological drought or rather the hydrological drought hazard and how to generate informative hydrological drought hazard indicators. So, um, I would like to start with uh, something that I'm sure you have seen before because it has been shown before. Just to remind you that in globe drought, we want to do a drought risk assessment. So the hazard assessment is one part of the risk. And I will focus here today on a special type of drought risk again, the hydrological, but I think it's very wide anyway. But you see the hazard is only related to climate. And uh, this figure was made by the IPCC in 2014. And uh, it is related to climate variability and anthropogenic climate change being a hazard to whoever or whatever. So when we think about drought, um, you heard about last time about the meteorological drought. And generally, people mean then just the precipitation up here. Um, so here the precipitation is what the meteorological drought is about. You now can also include potential evapotranspiration in, let's say, meteorological drought indicators. However, um, drought being less water than normal, um, it is also equally important, I mean, the, to follow the way of the precipitation that is less than normal. And so um, when you uh, see what less precipitation than normal will um, will lead to, this will be less soil moisture than normal. Then less soil moisture than normal will um, maybe lead to less runoff, total runoff than normal, will lead to less water stored in groundwater and will lead to less water in the rivers, to less stream flow. So, and it is mostly less water in the stream, less water in the groundwater than normal, less soil water than normal, that causes um, the risk to people or the negative impacts also to non-human biota. So in hydrology, one looks at what is called drought propagation. And this is a very schematic scheme where you see the time on the x-axis and how anomalous something is. And you see here, so to say, the meteorological part, how precipitation is lower than normal here and here. And then when the precipitation falls and converts into runoff, soil moisture, stream flow, and groundwater storage, you see the drought propagation in the sense that on the one hand, it is delayed. And on the other hand, you see the large storages, they get less of a variety, the temporal variability over time as compared to the precipitation signal. So I think a lot of work has been done by hydrologists um, on drought propagation. 
And it also shows that when you have uh, less normal than precipitation, less than normal precipitation, it's not the same as having less water than normal where you need it, maybe in the groundwater or, or in the stream. So these figures are from Van Loon et al. 2015. At the end of the presentation, I also have the references. Um, Anne Van Loon, she is a very, um, very uh, innovative researcher in drought, so I highly recommend her publications on drought. So, but let's look back again, drought risk assessment now. So it's about drought risk assessment. And I gave you here two examples, how uh, we want in globe drought um, define and compute drought risk as um, a function of the risk components hazard, exposure and vulnerability. And the first thing is you have to ask yourself, so for whom is the drought? I mean, the risk to whom? And here in the case, rainfed agriculture, the risk of which adverse drought impacts for whom? Well, here, the drought risk for rainfed agriculture would be the risk of reduced crop production for farmers. And then the hazard indicator would be anomalously high uh, soil water storage deficits as compared to optimal conditions. The exposure would be, well, is there any rainfed cropland area and how much? And the vulnerability of the system, you can distinguish here ecosystem susceptibility, so the crop yield decline due to soil water deficit, how large is that per deficit? Societal susceptibility, dependence of farm income on rainfed crop production, and then coping capacity or a lack of thereof, the capacity, for example, to invest in irrigation if you don't have enough rain for agriculture. You can cope with that. And now when we come more to what is called hydrological drought, that relates more to the drought in uh, the groundwater and the streams, but I think also in the soil, um, then uh, we can look at drought risk for hydropower production, for example. So the risk is the risk of reduced electricity production for energy supply companies. So they could be the affected group. The hazard would consist in enormously low stream flow and reservoir storage, where then the hydropower station is located at. The exposure would be, well, is there any hydropower production plan, let's say, or how much is the mean hydropower production at the, in the area to start with? Only then is there an exposure to that hazard. And then, well, ecosystem susceptibility is not applicable here. Societal susceptibility would be the share of total electricity production from hydropower, so that would be an indicator for societal susceptibility. And coping capacity would be the capacity to increase hydropower production efficiency, so you can produce more power with less water. So this, again, I, I wanted to show that to you that we don't look at the hazard at itself or just at drought, because there are many papers that just deal with indicators of drought. But what is drought? I mean, it is that, well, we have less water than normal. And in our framework, we think of it always as the hazard. So, and uh, so when we talk about the hydrological hazard, still the main point in our in globe drought is that we say um, that we have to relate, we have to find the right hazard indicators for the risk that we're looking at. So, but let me start out with simple definitions. So we are all on the same page. So hazard is the potential for a physical event or trend that may lead to negative impact. That's the hazard in the framework of climate change, but also just climate variability and thus drought. And then when we look at drought, the hazard refers to an event with less water than normal that poses a risk of negative impacts on humans and other biota. However, it seems, this definition seems easy and simple, but we are still struggling in our project with what drought really is. And there's really not much publications on that. People always compute some indicators or so, but really to talk about what is drought and your hydrological drought has it, this would be for me a goal that we can chat about that later, that we can discuss about that, about your uh, ideas about that. So just let me start with the questions. Is drought just a prolonged, abnormally dry period? That is what hydrologists or also meteorologists normally say. Or, now I follow the definition of the Australian Government Bureau of Metrology. 
a prolonged abnormally dry period when the amount of available water is insufficient to meet our normal use. So here all of a sudden the demand for water is in, while here it's, it's not related to any demand, it's just so to say the supply of water. And I think that could make a big difference when characterizing drought. So the question is, should we, that's one of the questions, should we analyze as droughts abnormally low values, for example, of soil moisture or precipitation or stream flow, or abnormally high deficits? So deficits as compared to what? Com a deficit as compared to a demand or to an optimal situation. For example, when you look at soil moisture, we know plants grow best when they can evapotranspirate at potential evapotranspiration. That happens at field capacity or more or less when the soil is at field capacity. And if it's less than the soil moisture is at a lower value than uh, field capacity, then there is a deficit. And the lower, the, the higher the deficit, the more the plant growth will suffer. So this is more what the Australian Government Bureau of Meteorology has in mind, I think. So these are the two options. Okay, keep that in mind. And uh, let's go back to that. What I said is that in globe drought, our ambition is that we define drought hazard indicators, including hydrological hazard indicators, um, by relating them directly to a risk. Because there are millions of ways to de define drought indicators or drought hazard indicators. You will find in literature so many possible th ways and you don't know why should the one work better than the other. It's all about indicating a hazard, but how do you do it best? So you have to think about drought risks of what and for whom, first of all, and then find the hazard variables that fit to that sort of drought risk. And uh, of course, in the next step, really then uh, compute those hazard indicators. So this, and we're not going to go through this whole uh, table, but um, just for you to, I think really one would have to be so specific um, when we say, oh, we want to, to uh, assess drought risk or we want to monitor drought risk. So we can start again here with risk of what? Risk of reduced crop or livestock production. That's a risk for whom? For the farmers, but also for the consumers. And when we think about um, drought-related hazard variables, the primary variable could be the soil water storage in case of rain-fed agriculture, stream flow and groundwater storage of ir in case of irrigated agriculture, because that's where the irrigation water comes from. And um, then we have a, you could also think about um, the ratio between AET, actual evapotranspiration, and potential evapotranspiration, because then also the lower that ratio is, the less well the plants can grow. And when we look at the hydropower production from the slide before, reduced hydropower production is a risk for energy companies and consumers, and there you would certainly look at stream flow, but also reservoir storage. When we look at thermal power production, same risk takers, um, you would maybe also look at temperature because uh, that uh, the temperature is important for how much water they can use there. And when we look at, um, for example, now look, let's look at not humans who are the risk takers. For example, um, it would be freshwater biota living in rivers, so fish and other um, smaller animals. So they have the risk of a change in habitat conditions in rivers so that they cannot live there well anymore. And they would, we would also look at stream flow and maybe a temperature. Anyway, so all of these risks of what and for whom may have different um, drought hazard indicators. Well, here only the variables are shown, but the precise um, definition of the indicator for how we combine then these um, variables or what sort of thresholds we use and so on, that might depend very specifically on the risks of what for whom. Okay, so how can you derive hydrological drought hazard indicators? Um, this is uh, described in more detail in the video that is available to you. Um, 
hydrological models have the advantage that they can compute the storages in the soil, in the groundwater, flows in the river or groundwater recharge that is very hard to measure or that are rarely measured. Hydrological models, of course, cannot compute uh, precipitation, so they, they need that as an input. So if you do not have enough data from observations on groundwater levels, on stream flow, on soil moisture, which you rarely have, then what you can do is set up a hydrological model of the region of interest, but you need climate data, and then you estimate time series of the various water flows and the storages at the required uh, spatial resolution. Required, I mean, you can't have a too high resolution depending on our larger areas. And then when you set up this model, you can compute time series of stream flow, of uh, water storage anomalies in groundwater, in lakes and reservoirs and wetlands, snow storage, uh, soil moisture, but you can also add it up totally to total water storage anomalies. And you could also compute the ratio of actual evapotranspiration to potential evapotranspiration. So, and on top, what you could also do um, in those models, you have these optimal values, let's say, for in the case of soil moisture, for example, field capacity, or in the case of some hydrological models, like our global model water gap, we also compute human water use. And so we do have uh, water demand. And then we can, for example, compute a deficit between stream flow and uh, the uh, water demand. So most hydrological models will be able to compute all these um, variables, storages, and flows that are very helpful to define um, drought hazards. So once you have set up this model, which of course takes its time and you need data, then uh, you can select, compute, evaluate, and finally visualize informative drought hazard indicators using the above variables or also the deficits. And um, what is uh, informative? Well, they need to be suitable for the very specific drought risks to be considered. If you look at drought risks for irrigated agriculture or rain-fed agriculture, for hydropower production, for domestic water supply, for the biota in the river, for wildfires, you no, know, something like that. So they need to be suitable. And uh, on the other hand, you have to take into account that all hydrological models are rather uncertain. I mean, they're just models of the reality, they're not the reality. And so um, hydrological modelers usually know best, I mean, what of their outputs here, stream flow, stream flow, groundwater storage, AT and so on, I mean, how reliable that is. And so they, it's a good idea to select indicators that are more or less reliably, uh, can be reliably uh, computed. You know? It's hard to judge sometimes what is reliable, but um, that's a, it's a second criterion for selecting um, suitable um, indicators of drought hazard. So um, we can, when we want to determine a drought condition at a certain point in time, we can use those so-called standardized drought indicators like the SPI that Helena Gardiner introduced last time. I'm not going to go into details, but here the important thing is that that always requires the fitting of distribution, um, which can be quite a hassle, and then you need to transform it to a normal distribution. And what do you get? You get, for example, it says an SPI, or you can do it for stream flow, then, then we can call it SSI3, aggregator of three months. If I have a value of minus one, that means that the stream flow of the last three months was one standard deviation lower than normal. Okay, so you can use these standardized drought indicators that are very widely used. The alternative is to def define percentiles, for example, the median or also the 20% percentile of this time series of stream flow, of groundwater storage, whatever during a reference period as a threshold, and then you say whenever the 
actual value is below that threshold, then uh, you are in a drought. And then this is the so-called drought deficit. It's a little bit different word, I mean, meaning of the deficit than when we say a deficit from an optimal condition or a water demand. So these are the general two options that you have. And then once you have defined what, you, what your threshold is, and then you can say, okay, whenever the actual um, value is below that threshold here, we just have one constant threshold, then this is when we are in drought. And then in yellow, this is um, the deficit volume. So you aggregate up every time step the, the deficit. And then this area under, under the threshold is then called the severity of the drought event. So this is the event that stops here and starts again another event. And here we have another event and the accumulated um, deficit here is the drought severity. So the severity of each event is the accumulated deficit of the last month of the drought event. And then once you have severities, you have a, let's say a 30 year time period or a 50 year time period, you can define um, a number of, you find a number of drought events. Each event has a severity and then you can fit a distribution to all drought events. And then this distribution then tells you what is the probability of occurrence of a drought event of a certain severity. So for example, um, we did a study um, more than 10 years ago on how drought might change in Europe due to climate change. And so, so for example, we said, well, in these areas of Europe, a drought that occurs here with a return, a drought that recurs now with a return period of uh, 10 years may in the future um, occur with a return period of 30 years or in other areas of five years. So this is how you can express the probability of occurrence of a drought and also how that changes with climate change. And um, just for you to show as an example um, how those things could look like but also how the relating that the, the pictures change when you use different indicators. Here we show four examples for threshold-based accumulated deficit volumes, so severities in a way, but in a certain month, October 2014. Um, so stream flow deficit in units of mean annual stream flow. So that means if there's a one, so this orange here, that means that during the drought, the mean annual stream flow, so the stream flow of a whole year is missing in that drought. No, so this is really then a strong drought. But then this depends on the threshold we have here. Here the threshold is the mean discharge. Here the threshold is, oh, only if the discharge is lower than the 20th percentile. It's called 80 here, but it's the 20th percentile, so a low flow value. We define that as drought. Here we have a threshold, the water use. And here we have a th threshold even a lower low flow value. So this is the 10th percentile, or in hydrology we call it Q90. So we'll skip that. It's also just another example. And I would like now to use the opportunity to um, ask you, first present you some questions, and then hopefully be able to discuss with you four questions altogether. Three questions relate to that big topic, that drought hazard, is defined as occurring when water flows or storage are less than normal. But then the question is, what on earth is normal? How can we define normal? So that it is an expression of the indicator is then an expression of a real drought hazard that may lead to a risk. So what is normal? So what would you say? Would you say we should Normal, we shouldn't say this is the mean value of, of, let's say, groundwater storage, the mean value of soil water storage, or the long-term mean of stream flow. But we should say, well, people and other biota are used to the mean seasonality of rainfall, stream flow, etc. So that we have a dry season and a wet season, a summer and a winter. So that we can say the mean monthly value, so the, value, the mean value for the January, the mean value for the 
February and so on, that they can, can be, be considered. That's normal, that's what people are used for. And then we should define that a drought happens in a certain month if the actual value of stream flow, let's say, is lower than this mean monthly value. That would be an op a possibility, and that is actually almost always done currently when people compute drought indicators. Then the next question is more interesting, maybe. Are people and other biota used to interannual variability of stream flow? And that is actually something that when you use the um, standardized um, drought indicators, that is what you assume. But also, if you use, let's say, as a threshold, a percentile of a flow or so. However, we would contend that this is maybe not the case. And for that, we have looked at the following here. Um, what you see here is rainfall, but you could do it with any other variable, stream flow or so. This is the SPI-12, so this is um, the drought hazard when you aggregate precipitation over 12 months. And minus one means that um, it's, uh, the, this, this rainfall is one standard deviation below the mean. And But then here on this axis, we have relative rainfall deviation, so the zero is mean the annual, the mean value of the rainfall, and minus, 50, minus 0 0.5 means 50% less, 0 0.5, 50% more. And what you see in the data you see here are data from two Iranian sites provided by my colleague Mohammed Hosseini. And what you see is at the same drought indicator, in a dry region, you have let's say 60% less rainfall than normal, while in a wet region, you only have like 35% less rainfall than normal. No? So the same, what is generally used as a drought indicator, this is then a normally dry condition. This means either maybe 50% less of rainfall if you're in a, than normal in a dry period, in a dry region, or but only let's say, it's hard to see here, 20% less in a wet region. And this is because dry regions generally have a higher interannual variability of rainfall. So when you would use the SPI 12 to compare two regions and say, okay, this region, they have the same SPI now in this month, so they have the same hazard, but in this one region means, oh, it's a wet region anyway, and they have 20% less than normal. And in the dry region means, oh, what, they have 50% less than normal. And my feeling is that um, people are not necessarily used to the interannual variability, but they do suffer or they have a higher hazard uh, under this condition of the minus 50% relative rainfall deviation uh, than here in the wet region, even though they have the same drought class. Question three is, again, what are normal conditions? Now, if we look at precipitation, we don't have that problem. But if we look at groundwater storage in particular, then we have the following problem. The groundwater storage, of course, it also fluctuates with the seasons. And for, that's why you could like uh, fluctuate in precipitation or in stream flow. You could compute drought as, um, let's say, as the deviation from the seasonal means. However, uh, this is a grid cell in Northwest India, and this is the relative groundwater storage anomaly. And what you see is this constant, this is the seasonality. So what you see here is the seasonality, the small wiggles here is the seasonality. But what you see is this constant decline of groundwater storage, because there our model computes a depletion of groundwater because of groundwater abstractions being larger than groundwater recharge. So if you say, so what is normal here? Well, you look through over the whole reference period and the normality would be something here in between. And we would here, when you do just normal um, drought computation, you could would compute in the beginning, no drought at all, the first half of the reference period. And then in the second half of the reference period, of course, you're always below normal conditions, normal conditions being defined as the mean over a reference period here. And so, is that now drought when people have groundwater depletion? 
Well, it's drought, but if it's just an anomaly with climate, then this is this would not be a good way to do droughts. So the question is, should we refer with drought when we look at drought, should we say, okay, well, they have less water than normal in the latter half of the period, though well, that is a drought. Or should we say, no, no, with drought, we only mean the seasonal and interannual variability here. So we should refer maybe to virtual natural conditions. How would the groundwater storage look like if we would not have this overexploitation of groundwater? And those virtual conditions that they have then more a stationary mean, no, so stationary, always the same mean. Um, and those virtual conditions could be computed by hydrological models because we could drive our model only by climate and not uh, by human water use on top. So this is the next question. How on earth should we define um, drought if there is a depletion of storage? And that relates not only to groundwater, but could also relate to lakes. Think of the Aral Sea. No, and so Van Loon has somehow suggested one, that one could use those naturalized conditions as normal and then distinguish what is the human induced drought and what is the climate induced drought part. And the last one is what I already um, asked you before, should drought hazard be identified not only as a function of the deviation from normality, but also with respect to the deviation from a demand, let's say. No, and the demand could be well, field capacity because then in the case of soil, because plants need that to grow optimally, or we could use as a demand also the human water demand, and then look at human water demand minus stream flow. Okay, here you can find all the references here with three from Van Loon, as I said, that I recommend, and this is a very basic one that introduces the SPI, also very good. And this is a paper that I wrote on integrating risk of climate change in water management together with all my colleagues from IPCC. Yeah. So here you find again the questions. And I'm looking forward to discussing these questions with you. But of course, uh, you should start with asking me questions if I was too quick and you have questions better, for better understanding. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And everybody, you can ask questions or provide your inputs on the questions provided by writing in the chat box in the bottom uh, right corner. Or you can also click on the button in the, the top toolbar to raise your hand, and then we can open your microphone. So please go ahead. The, the floor is open to whoever wants to say anything. Hi, Diana. So Diana, is, I would like to ask if human actions such as deviation of a river can influence the generation, or oh, the second, my phone is ringing, this is too bad, such as a, a deviation of a river can influence the generation of a meteorological and a hydrological drought. Uh, no, 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 no. A deviation, you mean that you, the river is changed, the river path is changed from its normal river path? 
Yeah. No, I mean, not at all. Because drought happens when you have, I mean, really comes from less water than normal, but also, let's say, higher temperatures and higher evapotranspiration. And that is not really accept, I mean, affected by that. No. So if nobody has a question, maybe you can give answers. I mean, what do you think about, let's say, maybe start with question two. I find that a very difficult one. Okay, interannual variability means the year-to-year -year variability. So the precipitation in the year 1991 is different from 1992, different from the precipitation in 1993, and so on. And so one can describe the interannual variability, for example, by the standard deviation of annual precipitation, as an example. So you have a time series of... Um, precipitation values, let's say annual precipitation values, and then um, the distribution of those annual values can be um, analyzed regarding its standard deviation, for example. And uh, for example, if rainfall is 800 millimeters per year and the standard deviation is, let's say, 150 millimeter per year, then 66% of the years have a rainfall between 800 minus 150 millimeters, so 650 millimeters, um, and, 1, 000, uh, and 950 millimeters. So, yeah. And as I said, um, semi arid areas have a higher interannual variability of precipitation and therefore stream flow and so on. Than humid, uh, than humid areas. Yeah, you can say in some sense people get used to that, but on the other hand, when you look around, if you're in a dry area and you get 50% less rainfall as compared to a wet area and you get 20% less rainfall, well, that would be the same as regarding the SPI, but I think people in a dry, in that dry area with 50% less rainfall than normal will suffer more, I guess. So Gerard van der Schlier says, I guess everybody knows that one year can be drier wetter than the other, but there's a clear idea of what people would find normal. Oops, now I cannot read now of what people would find normal in terms of rainfall amount or start of the rainy, rainy season. And I mean, the season, yes. But um, what do you think like with this interannual variability? So um, people have a mean, there's a mean value of let's say 800 millimeter per year, 30, mean, 30 year average. But then from year to year, I mean, what, do you think there is a clear idea what that people are in some areas used to more um, interannual variability and therefore um, are not so they don't feel the hazard so much they don't feel that as a hazard so much if there is uh, fifty percent less rainfall than the long term mean annual value. So. 
So, which is a semitis error. Gisova says, I think that drought hazard should be identified with respect to the deviation of water availability from a demand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is also an idea no, that we have. This is the question number four. Thank you for this input. So I'm glad multiple attendees are typing. So I'm looking forward to your questions and comments. Diana agrees with Chitsova. Now Tiago uh, says, thank you, Petra. I'm Tiago, a demographer from Brazil. Do you think that urbanization is a possible solution to mitigate the drought hazards? Well, when you think of agricultural drought hazards, the less people are in, let's say, um, agriculture, um, the drought, I mean, what I would say is that drought hazard is not affected in that sense, but the drought risk is affected because you still have, let's say, when you think of um, risk for agriculture, the hazard is still there, less rainfall than normal, less irrigation water than normal. But then if you don't have so much agriculture anymore, then you have less of a risk. And you also have less of a risk, I would say, if you have large, um, large producer companies. So these companies that have, I mean, uh, in northern Argentina and southern Argentina and western Argentina and eastern Argentina, if as a company, a large industrial agricultural company, you have your, uh, your fields everywhere, your crop growing areas everywhere, you're much less vulnerable. So also the vulnerability would decrease with a certain amount of urbanization. On the other hand, you still have to produce the crop. So I think um, the hazard is not affected, I would say. And then a drought hazard when it's a go with water supply, I mean, it could even be if people are more concentrated in one area, you could even think that if then a drought hits, then more people will be affected by that certain drought because more people are dependent on the water availability in a certain area. So let me check. Um, Katarina says, I think people are differently. Okay. Um, uh, lost it. Ah, oh, yeah. Katarina, I think people are differently vulnerable or differently well adjusted to different amounts of rainfall. So I think you could say that in some areas people could be used to less water and maybe have some coping mechanisms. Yes. So I think to define drought, it should always be checked with the people what they consider a drought and that what severity has an impact on them they consider as disruptive. Yeah. I think you're totally right. However, in globe drought, we have the task to provide a global drought monitor platform. So we want to provide similar to what happens at the Joint Research Center at ISPRA with a global drought observatory. We want to provide based on our modeling and other um, satellite data, we want to provide a global overview of where drought is happening right now. Because um, of course, it would be good to check with the people, but that requires very specific projects. So most of the time, you don't have a running drought assessment program in a certain area. So we want to provide something that is accessible to everybody around the globe and also to see um, also um, global relations. Because, for example, for people that live in some area, it is, could be very important to see what the drought, what drought is occurring if drought is occurring somewhere else, if, for example, this would be an area where they grow similar crops to the crops in the area of interest, because that has then an impact on uh, crop prices on the global market. So we have a more global perspective here. But if you have a local perspective and you have the time and the money to do very specific studies at the local scale, that for sure is the right way of doing it. Okay, Gerard van der Schier says, the human demand should not enter the drought hazard. It would be more appropriate to have this invulnerability. Mm -hmm. It would be strange that if rainfall does not change, but population increases, 
that the drought hazard would increase. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is also a typical way of thinking, but I showed you that in, in even the metrology service in, in uh, Australia has a different idea, no? So, and the drought hazard, we said that in the, the vulnerability, um, you could put it in there, it would be a possibility, I agree. Um, for our project, we felt that maybe we put it in hazard because, yeah, it maybe only becomes a hazard if it is um, it's related to a demand, as we said. And another thing, maybe other vulnerability indicators uh, are only available at the country scale. So when we do our modeling, we model that at the spatial resolution of 50 by 50 kilometers, while normal vulnerability um, 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 data is only available at country scales if you work globally. So that was another reason why we might want to put this in uh, in the hazard. But um, yeah, I agree. It, it, you can look at it that way. Well, then there will be more people exposed to the drought. Um, I'm not sure what this refers to. Maybe it is not the hazard, including the people demand. But hazard plus demand increase the likelihood of a disaster, for sure. So you, there is, you could put demand as a, as a vulnerability, and that is rather typical. But you can then be less precise. Here, we would really look in every month or let's say a year, what is the relation between um, the availability of water and the demand. And I think it's clear, even though the availability of water, the stream flow, is less than normal, but if it is, if that water that is less than, than normal is much higher than what is needed by humans, well, I think it's then also not a hazard. No? That's me. Just to say it again, unfortunately, I cannot draw it somewhere here or write it down. What I say is, what would you say um, that uh, if I say, imagine the situation where a stream flow value in a certain month is much lower than normal. At the same time, think about where you are in Finland. No? And then in Finland, it's much lower than normal. But is that any hazard, at least to people, if the demand for, of water for people in this, uh, at this stream is much lower than the actual um, water availability in that month? Can that be then called a hazard? Okay, Katarina is talking about the risk due to drought because we are combining the hazard, hazard and the vulnerability expressed in terms of exposure. Mm -hmm. Katarina, over a longer period of time, this would still be a hazard because the water availability decreases more and more over time, I would feel. No, mm -hmm. that I don't get. The water availability does not decrease over time. It depends where you are in some areas it will decrease due to climate change and in others it will increase. Or you mean it decreases because more and more water are taken up upstream. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but then that, that would be something like what I showed you with the groundwater storage. No? So this a long-term trend towards less water, would you call that anything like a drought or is that not something totally else? That's it. When you when we would set would like to set up a drought monitoring system, and then this monitoring system would show a hazard, because what in reality happens that we decrease water storage in the groundwater or also in the river, the flow in the river over a long term, over a long term due to human water use, would you expect that that would show as a drought, 
Or would you expect that would be shown somehow else, that we have a long-term trend or so? Because it's not really what the definition of a drought is. Okay. Stefano says, does population play a dual role, being both exposed to reduced water availability and decreasing the water availability? Well, if you talk about stream flow in particular, yes, because it's not, it's if you have increased water use upstream, then that decrease over, if, if over time water use increases upstream, that will lead to decreasing average water availability downstream. And of course, the, you have a larger exposure if you have more people. Yeah. Okay. Then, oops. Katarina says, it relates to the example you just put, that you have much less water available than was needed. Yeah. And you said this would not be a hazard. But if this happens over longer term, it would still be a hazard. Yes. Because water decrease over time would be at one point become a drought, if then listen. Yeah. But see, this is the, the pop. And when I noticed that also the way you use the, you, you term, use the word drought is in a way that other people would, would use the term water scarcity. So in my classes, I always say, well, you have to distinguish drought from water scarcity. Drought is something related to the variability of climate the natural variability of climate. Of course, it's changed by climate change, but well, the natural variability of climate, that's it was generally thought to be a drought. And then when you have less and less water available, or you have less water available than you want, in the long term, that's what people would call water stress or water scarcity. And it's generally distinguished. Mm -hmm. Okay. Could you could you think about we have maybe only a few minutes left with this interannual variability? I'm really curious of you for you from you because I'm not clear about that. Um, what you would say that classically those those standardized uh, precipitation index and so on they assume that people are used to the interannual variability because well they used they know that in, in let's say in morocco they know that uh, in one year they can have 100 millimeter of rainfall in the next it can be 500 and so on well in germany people are not used to so much variability of rainfall between the years but so as i showed in this example um the same difference between the, the long-term mean and a certain va annual value would uh, show as a lower uh, drought hazard when you use those normal uh, standardized uh, drought indicators. And do you have any, any opinion on that? that if the SPI is the same for in a wet, in a dry area, in a wet area with a lower, lower temporal variability, in a dry area with a higher, then that is really the same drought hazard. Like in Brazil, for example, if you're in northeastern part of Brazil, people should be used to a high variability of, of uh, stream flow and uh, precipitation than in the south of uh, the, more met, the more humid part of Brazil, either in the Amazon or also in the, north of, in the south of Brazil. So how do you see that? Are they used to that or not?
Mm -hmm. Diana says, in the north of Colombia, people is getting used to the interannual variability. Mm -hmm. Okay. Also because of phenomena such as El Niño and La Niña. Yeah. Yeah, so that the interannual variability is clearer in the mind, no? It's more talked about and... Uh, and when you say getting used, it means that, well, they know that this occurs, that in a Nino years they have more or less, and then La Nina, or that, that means also they are now better equipped to deal with these um, interannual, the large interannual variability nowadays. When you say is getting used, means they are now better equipped for the interannual variability. So they can cope with that better. Um, Diana? Okay, so Katarina says, I think this is not easy to say in general. I agree. <laughs> I feel this comes back to the fact that people should be asked how adjusted, vulnerable they are, or how well the structures are set to deal with this in the annual variability. Yep, that is maybe true. You can't say anything in general. Aware. I, oh, Diana says in Colombia, people now are more aware of the maybe even increasing interannual variability, but they're not necessarily better equipped. So, yeah. So they would feel that it's an, it's, it is a hazard. It is a hazard. Mm -hmm. The SPI is a metric that relates rainfall variability against the climatology. So your question is actually if the people are adapted to the climate or not. Yeah. So are they adapted to the seasonality of the climate and to the interannual variability of the climate? Yes, that is the question. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Diana. I read it. Mm -hmm. Yep, this is adaptation, yeah. Okay, now. Tiago writes, in my area of study, Brazil in Northeast. Oh, I had that, I was there also. We are used to think in two types of droughts, precipitation lower than average in a short period, like a year and a more intense scarcity of presentation in intervals around 30 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when you say lower than average, average means um, the mean, the, the, the average means the arithmetic mean of the precipitation. So the arithmetic mean of, um, let's say, the, the July precipitation or the wet season precipitation. This is, what is the difference, so to say? What is average, so to say? The second of the population, there is no coping strategies to live. Yeah, so you, the second type here, you refer to these long-term droughts. So this heavy, uh, long-term, long-lasting droughts. Yeah. So certainly, no, this is this is then also comparable to these droughts that that were in in California from 2012 to 2016, and there was this very long millennia drought in Australia from 2000, I think, three to 2010 or so. No, so these longer ones, these long droughts. Yeah, these long droughts we certainly will capture. I mean, maybe with these very heavy droughts, in a way, I think you capture with every indicator that you choose, I guess. So, yeah. Okay. So, Tiago says, the threshold would be lower than average from the same month, comparing in the historical series. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that mean, that would mean you do not use the SPI, because there it's not only, don't refer only that it's lower than average, but it compares it to the standard deviation of the monthly values. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Yeah. Well, I think we, of course, I mean, I could not expect you to answer all these questions, but you gave me some indications of what you think. So thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure. Um, Yannick, aren't we at the end of this webinar when I look at the time? Yes, uh, I think that's that's it. So I would like to thank everybody again, uh, Petra Dell, for your presentation and for leading the discussion, and everybody for your inputs. And as already mentioned, there's also the video lecture if you haven't watched it already. And uh, quite soon we will upload the recording of this webinar. So it will also be available on the learning platform. And lastly, if you have any more any more questions or comments or feedback, feel free to share it also in the discussion forum that you will find on the learning platform. So some further thoughts on these questions at a later stage. I would be really appreciating your input because we are struggling with these things. You certainly right who said that this is a local issue, but as our task for this project is to provide a global information platform, we have to make, so to say, decisions. So that's why, I mean, we can't decide on a local scale, which normally would be the best. So thank you very much. And maybe we have the opportunity to communicate at a later point. Bye-bye. Right. Goodbye.